So welcome to our fifth INR All Hands meeting. Uh, you'll recall that we do these once a semester. And this is our fifth one in the series. We started in January of 2011. And we've got a lot of information coming at you this morning. You probably learned over the course of the previous four that the information builds upon itself in the journey that we're, we're currently on in INR. And this morning's no exception to that. We've got a lot to tell you about and a lot to update you about, and some things that are new for you that you won't have seen before as well. So I'm glad that we have a great crowd here on East Campus in the East Union, and we have uh, probably three times this many joining us online. The last few of these, we've ended up with 300 roughly in this room. That's about where we'll end up today. And last time, I think we had 800 online live with us, so we welcome our online folks with us today, both on campus and throughout the state, and look forward to a really good discussion with you. Now I'm gonna move pretty fast. I'm gonna warn you this morning that we've got a lot to cover, so I am going to move very rapidly. But I wanna lay out for you a little bit of the, the ground that we're going to cover. You're gonna hear a little different theme from me this morning than you've heard the last four times. And that theme is going to deal with focus finding balance and focus in what we're doing. And I want to spend a little bit of time right up front talking to you about what balance means in the world we live in today. That is a somewhat kind of polarized climate. I want to talk a little bit about that. And there's some issues surrounding that kind of climate that affect us and affect us directly in our work and what we do. I want to talk about that a little bit. I certainly want to talk about the opportunities and challenge challenges that the world has for us. We've been doing that each time and there's some new ones this morning that I want to bring into that discussion. We'll spend the brunt of our time on this third item, which is really where we are in achieving our goals that we've set, both at the university level to the next six or seven year time period and at the INR to 2025 level that started us in this discussion uh, two years ago now, three years ago. And then lastly, we started this tradition uh, last time, earlier this calendar year, when we've chosen to honor some servant leaders in the Institute uh, in various ways. And I want to spend some time talking about those people at the end of our time this morning and the contributions that they've made and why we've chosen to honor them for their work. Now I said up front that what I want us to do this morning is to focus and to spend some time thinking about what's important, what we need to focus on, why, and then you'll, you'll kind of get the theme here, you see the little Nike marketing sploosh there, that it's just time to do it. You know, we're at the stage now where we have a lot of things on the plate, we've articulated a lot of new things on the plate, on top of all of the things that we've always done in the Institute, and uh, aligned uh, areas of the Institute, and now we're at the stage where we're doing a lot of these things rather than just the concepts and talking about them. So I'll spend some time talking with you about that idea of it's really time to just do it. Now we do have a special guest with us this morning and at a, at an, a convenient break point in the discussion, she's going to perform for you. We co-commissioned uh, with the Lead Center for the Performing Arts an artist named Susan Werner. And some of you will be familiar with Susan and her work. She's a folk musician is the way I characterize her broadly. Hope that doesn't, I hope that works, Susan, wherever you're at. Um, and, and she's over here on the side. She's an Iowa farm girl, raised on a farm in eastern Iowa. And she uh, was interested in doing a portfolio of new music on agriculture and farming and the way of life of agriculture. And so she's debuting that tonight at the Lead Center for the Performing Arts downtown. And we've asked her to come and she's gonna give you a song or two out of that, that new album that'll kind of break up the monotony of, the, 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 of me um, <laughs> for you so you have a little better time this morning. So we appreciate Susan being with us and we'll look forward to hearing from her in a few minutes. So let's start with talking about this issue of balance. Now I realize that the word balance can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. You can cut this a lot of different ways, right? Balance in your personal life, balance in your professional life, balance 
across everything that you do, balance in terms of dealing with differing opinions and different subjects where there's disagreement on various things. There's a lot of different ways you can cut the term uh, balance. And I do think sometimes that we find ourselves looking like some of these pictures. You know, that elephant picture is one that we can all relate to um, often. And, and I, I want to dwell specifically this morning more so on the, the programmatic balance side, on these subjects that sometimes uh, create a lot of noise for us and create a lot of dissonance, and we can get distracted by that dissonance if we're not uh, careful. So my, my point with that up front is that, you know, I find us, and I'm sure you do too, that uh, feeling like we live in more and more of a polarized culture. That there are more and more things that there is this or that, and there's no in between. And we see that escalating really in our culture. We certainly see it escalating in our political culture. We're all experiencing that uh, from watching our political culture play out uh, in recent years and certainly in front of us at the current time. So how do we deal with that? You know, do we listen to that? Do we get distracted by that? Do we, does that dissonance get us off course, so to speak? It's easy to let it. I find it happening to me. You know, it, it, it gets me off course sometimes. But I think we need to pay attention to just focusing on what matters and not let that dissonance get in our way. So that's my first point I want to make this morning. No matter how dissonant it may seem, we don't have a farm bill. <laughs> we don't have an appropriations bill. I'm going to talk about that later in the presentation. We don't know what the future of federal funding looks like. We certainly have a big research goal for the university and federal research funds being sequestered and drying up is a, is a fear and something to be concerned about when we have a big goal for research. But my message to you this morning is to not let those things get you off balance, to not let that dissonance cre uh, muddle and confuse who we are and what we do. Um, and I hope you can understand what I say, uh, what I mean by that when I say it. So focus, especially right now, I think is extremely important. We have a mission that is central and critical, not only to this university, but to greater mankind. And focus right now is probably more important than it's ever been. And I remind myself of that every day, that we're on a mission here, a journey that's very, very important, and focusing on what matters is, is really important for us to do. Now I'm gonna just start with a few of these outside world kind of things. There will be some building on what you've seen from me previously. There will be some different nuances of what you heard me say previously. I've already mentioned that the political climate out there is chaotic for us currently, especially domestically. It's very chaotic in the U.S. to understand that, very unpredictable. Who would have ever dreamed, I certainly wouldn't have dreamed it in my lifetime, that the House of Representatives in the, U in the U.S. Congress would not pass a farm bill. I never thought I would see that happen in my life. It happened this year. So it's a very unpredictable political climate that we live in. State and local economy, all trends are still pointing up for us. The national economy is beginning to point up. Jobs data came out today, you may have seen it already. Unemployment rate slightly down, jobs growth is slightly up. So there's some, some arrows beginning to point up on the economic side. But the economy that impacts us very directly here in Nebraska, the agriculture and natural resource based economy, has some considerations that we're watching very carefully. The impact of this lingering drought that we have that's not quite let go of us yet and what that might mean economically for the state creates some uncertainty. The potential for a land price bubble, there are people out there that are concerned about that. You've heard me talk a lot about the land price escalation that we've seen here in this part of the world in particular. I'll show you some data on that here in a moment. There's a growing divide in what I call the European policy and the American policy related to agriculture. Sometimes it seems like we're coming closer together and then all of a sudden it seems like we're further apart. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that and what it means for us. An increasing clamor for a share of global markets 
for the products from a natural resource-based economy continues to be there and it's important for us to be thinking about. This drought picture, you know, this has become, you know, it used to be when I was growing up, you watched to see what was happening in the Vietnam War from Walter Cronkite. God, I just dated myself really badly. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's what we did every night uh, after we ate supper, right? Now, that's what I do every day, every week, is watch this drought map, you know, that we produce here at the University of Nebraska, as you know, at the National Drought Mitigation Center. And it's, it's changed a lot over the last year and a half. Certainly last year it was really red and brown. At this time, remember how bad it was last September and how many states were impacted, how far east it had gone into Indiana and Illinois and the northern, northern central Great Plains. Um, and now it's retreated more southwest. You know, a couple of months ago it would have been even further retreated southwest and now it's creeped back, as you know, and begun to creep back again into the Corn Belt uh, that really was very, very wet. Remember early this spring? Wettest spring in Iowa and now the driest late summer in Iowa and sometimes. So we, we've still got this drought that we're dealing with. Last year, in the face of that drought, we still saw a $5.9 billion net farm income in Nebraska. That was last year's 2012 number. Still the second highest in history. We're predicting this year, based on USDA data, data, DA data that we've seen so far, nationally they just adjusted the national number down to 120.6 billion. It was 129, roughly, before this dry weather hit. And we're still expecting Nebraska's number to be in that 5.9 or higher range for this year. So that's phenomenal that we still have that level of robust economy, even under the, the case of a drought. I also have in this slide, and I put it there intentionally, to point out the importance that UNL Extension has played in dealing with this drought. And the drought resources that they have brought to the table collectively have helped to mitigate that, have helped our producers throughout the state and the region really deal more effectively with the impact of drought. And my hats are off to all of you who have been involved in that effort for the last uh, year and a half. So what's 2013 look like? Big question mark. We don't know yet. We really won't know till we begin to see harvest estimates later uh, in the season. Uh, but one thing that we do know is that land values continue to escalate even with the drought. And if you look at this slide, it may be a little hard for you to see in the back. Nebraska showed last year from 2012 to 2013, these are numbers that just came out, from the National Ag Statistics Service earlier, uh, well, last month, uh, was still about 18% up in average land value. The previous year, from 2011 to 2012, for Nebraska was 33.3%, to put that in context. So last year, Nebraska was the largest number on the map in percentage increase. This year, we're amongst the largest numbers on the map and that continues to escalate. Whether there's a land bubble there or not, we don't know. We'll see uh, what happens. This global issue, Europe versus the US. Some of you may have seen this hit the press yesterday. The Economist magazine, the international publication out of, out of, based out of Europe, they were here last week. Their Washington bureau chief was on campus here. Uh, I didn't know that he was a blogger with the name Lexington at the time. But he is. So yesterday in The Economist, this hit. And it talks about the difference between European agriculture and the difference between American agriculture based on science and based on things like 4-H in, in, uh, innately putting science into the picture of young people and how it's done that for a long time. Please go read this article. It talks about UNL. It talks about the Nebraska State Fair. It talks about the importance of science, which of course is one of our key higher areas that we've uh, gone down the road in in science literacy. A beautiful article uh, that talks about the difference in our perspectives. And the conclusion is that we're trying to produce for the world, Europe's trying to preserve and protect. And I think we all kind of recognize that as the different 
philosophy behind what we do, and I would encourage you to go read it. Global trade. There's on the back table back here a new publication, the new version of Strategic Discussions for Nebraska that is now published out of ALEC. And it talks about Nebraska being the global epicenter of the beef industry. We could write this for several other areas as well related to uh, agricultural production. And you would see there in the picture in the bottom, Levon Heidemann, our Lieutenant Governor, just in the last few days on a trade delegation. This particular picture happens to be with the Vice President of Taiwan where tremendous effort is being put into place for trade of products from this state, much depending on the future of, of trade. Why do we do things like have a very large number of Chinese students here that just left last month working with faculty across the campus in research undergraduate experiences, second year of this that we've experienced? Why do we do that? What I just showed you is a big part of why we do that on top of learning from one another, and on top of the diversification that that provides to our students and learning about the people they're going to be dealing with throughout their lifetime as trade partners, in this case, um, around agriculture. Let's talk a little bit about funding. I'll do this very, very quickly because there's not a lot new to tell you, but I do want you to know what the full picture is. So we do, of course, need to pay attention to where our finances come from, how we're funded, what the outlook for those finances looks like both short and long term. So here's that picture. You'll remember last spring we were in the middle of the legislative session for the unicameral here in Nebraska. It was a budget setting year of the legislature, setting the budget for the next two fiscal years that we started July 1, FY14 and FY15. The proposal in front of the legislature basically said that if the legislature gave us a roughly 4% increase per annum, in the NU budget that we would hold resident tuition to no increase for the next two years. And largely that's what the legislature did. They gave us a little less, about 0.1 or 0.2 percent less than we requested, but roughly 4 percent per annum increase in the NU budget this year and next year. Also increased our program of excellence funding. We have some of those programs of excellence in INR from one million per year to two and a half million per year. So there was some good news for new emphasis in research at the uh, central administration level. And of course the Board of Regents followed through with no resident tuition increase for the next two years um, in our history. Included in that, roughly a 3% salary increase per each of those two years. We've just gone through that first exercise um, uh, in the last few months. So that's a generally good picture. And if you go around the country, you know, remember the last few years I've been telling you about how great we are look compared to the others around us? Around the country, that's beginning to change. Because more, more states now are moving into the neutral to maybe turning that tide back around category economically in their states. And there were quite a few states like us that had this exact same model asked the legislature to increase the budget about in the amount you would have had to increase tuition um, so that we could keep costs down for our students moving forward, which of course is a nationally very big issue currently around higher education. The net effect of that state budget, you'll remember that last year in FY13, we talked about there being a slight reallocation need in the permanent budget that we handled uh, in each of the academic parts of the university internally. Um, in our case, it's about a half million dollar shortfall in INR, our share of the shortfall in the university. That is now carried forward. We need to permanentize that. We will do that this year. You will hear Harvey talk about that in his State of the University address next Tuesday when he addresses the entire university. Not a big deal. It's not a big deal. I don't want you to, to uh, worry about it or think it's a big deal. Other than that, we're not anticipating a lot of need for reallocation or being concerned about budget. So things are pretty neutral here relative to our state budget. There are two things that we are watching very, very, very carefully. And I've listed them here. Because we're going into a, a interim year between budget years in the unicameral starting in January, there often are study task forces that are passed in the budget year. And one of those is dealing with water funding. 
and we're watching that very, very carefully. It's been an issue in the state for a number of years around how to marshal enough funding around water resources and issues associated with water resources. We're certainly very interested in that, watching it very carefully. The other one I'll come back to here in a minute is tax reform. And you heard the governor talk last year about wanting to do away with income tax at the state level. Um, that didn't happen, of course, but this study task force did happen. And there's a group now grappling with that and what kind of tax reform might be possible at the state level, which obviously has big impact, uh, potential impact for us. Uh, could be negative, could be positive. So we're watching that one very carefully. Federally, I already told you <laughs> what to expect. We don't know what to expect at the federal level. We have a very divided government. We have a very unpredictable situation. Our, our research title and education title is part of the Farm Bill that impacts us most directly. Our formula funds, capacity funds for Hatch for the experiment station and Smith Lever for extension and McIntyre Stennis for forestry make up a little less than 5% of our total budget. To put it in context, so we have a 190 some odd million dollar annual budget in INR, about 8 million of that is in capacity or formula funds. Now that's the good news. The bad news is those are all people. Those are largely all people dollars. So if sequestration hits as it did this past year, so since we met last time, we had a $600,000 sequestration hit to our budget. In those capacity funds, we had set aside money to prepare for that. We always do that in a contingency basis, so it didn't impact us in the current cycles. But the plan is, unless something changes, that sequestration will happen annually on those uh, discretionary funds in the U.S. government. So we're watching that very carefully. The authorization bills, the appropriation language in both the Senate and the House for the ag appropriations bills are good, but unless something drastically happens between now and September 30th, they'll probably never see the light of day. They probably won't ever see conference in Congress. And we'll go back to some kind of continuing resolution, which is where we've been before. And we may go back to pre-sequestration levels again with another sequestration put on it. So we're, we're watching that carefully. Now this slide is, is there with a picture for a reason. I told you the last couple of times we've met that I'm absolutely convinced we need to take a different road. And that the capacity funds that have been part of this picture for a long time are going to diminish and largely go away. And we need to plan accordingly for that. We need to think about where we're going to have that capacity. How we're going to have those funds without losing capacity. You with me? So if you remember a minute ago when I was talking about tax reform, you know, we have a lot of groups, I've mentioned these to you before, that we're engaged in nationally talking about new models for federal funding. Um, and those are gaining some traction. I think they really are gaining some traction. Uh, and I, before I come back to that tax reform issue, I want to tell you about two discussions we plan to have here in Lincoln around those subjects. Uh, the Hearman Lectures, November 5th, we have invited uh, Secretary Vilsack, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, to come and address the National Rural Futures Conference and the Hearman Lecture jointly uh, on November the 5th. Uh, we're pretty sure he's gonna do that. They never will tell you for sure as a politician till the last minute. But we're ask actually asking him to come address, has rural America really lost its voice and how does it regain it? He gave a pretty landmark speech in December about that uh, that created quite a stir out in the public about losing the rural voice. And so we've asked him to come back and address that. Some implications of that deal with the Farm Bill and deal with the research titles we're talking about. And then on January the 14th, we've invited a panel to come have a conversation with us, similar to what we did with the sec former Secretaries of Ag a year ago, to talk about the future of agricultural research and education in the U.S. And we particularly framed it along the lines of how do we regain leadership because we have slipped and lost some of that leadership around the world to China and Brazil in the last few years. And you can see the list of people involved there. Kathy Wotecki is the person in the seat at USDA overseeing all of research, education, and economics. 
and Kathy was enthusiastic about coming and being part of this panel to talk about these different threads of conversation. Dan Glickman leads the Agree Group, leads the Chicago Council on Global Affairs Group, the two of those bullet items in the previous slide. Uh, Jeff Simmons, the CEO of Elanco, um, and Jim Burrell, the Executive Vice President of Pioneer DuPont, uh, are both members of what's called the Global Harvest Initiative, a group that's advocating for uh, reform in agricultural research and education. And then Phil Pardee is an, an economist at the University of Minnesota who's done a lot of the background economics work for a couple of these groups uh, and is on that panel that I've referred to earlier that we're reviewing USDA. He's one of my fellow panelists uh, on that, that panel currently. So we're really excited about that. Those are important discussions. Now, what I was mentioning earlier about tax reform, we're beginning to make the argument to the state of Nebraska that we can't think about this the way we've always thought about it before. If we're going to be competitive for more competitive funds, which is where this reform is going, is to put more money into competitive funds at the national level and fewer to no funds in capacity, that's where the discussion is headed, then how do we really position ourselves to be the entity that is at the lead of getting those competitive funds? Well, the way we have to position ourselves is to keep our capacity and grow it. So these new hires we're making currently, it's a big part of that, of that process of getting that capacity and keeping that capacity. So you're going to hear us arguing in tax reform that perhaps the state needs to replace this capacity, then not rely on the federal government for that capacity. That's a little bit of a ball to push up the hill, but it's a hill that we're beginning to really frame and think about how we're going to do that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about goals. So the next part of this presentation, and we'll get part of the way into this, and then I'm going to have Susan come up and uh, do one of her songs for you, is to frame <coughs> where we are relative to the discussions that we've had, both at the campus level at UNL and at the INR level. Uh, for the campus goals and for the 2025 discussion that we launched a few years ago. So there's two cuts of this. 2018 is the campus goals. Remember Chancellor Perlman talking about these two years ago when he articulated six broad goals for the UNL campus that we wanted to reach by 2017-2018, that academic year out there into the future. So 2018 is the picture of those goals and where we are in meeting those goals. We have articulated some fairly ambitious milestones against those goals for INR. What we want to achieve and contribute to those university goals. I want to also say, and I put his picture here for a reason, um, I can't tell you how lucky I am to work with this guy. He's a brilliant chancellor and he, he knows what he's doing I know that sometimes in the past you might have wondered if he, what he thought about agriculture. I can tell you he believes in agriculture, he thinks very strongly about agriculture, but his legacy at this university is going to be huge. And you'll hear him talk a little bit about that next week at the State of the University address. You can't look around this campus and not see Harvey Perlman written all over it in so many ways. So when you see him, pat him on the back for that. You know, he doesn't get a lot of that very often uh, and he deserves it. So remember what those goals are. Increasing enrollment by 5,000 students, that one's a really dicey one, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, increasing faculty in order to meet that enrollment and to build that capacity to better serve our students and our constituents. You know, improving our six-year graduation rate by 7% from 63 where it started to 70% for the university. Increasing research expenditures by almost double to 300 million by 2018. Increasing national and international recognition of our faculty and, and I would add staff. Successfully launch phase one of Innovation Campus. So let's kind of quickly reiterate where we're at on those. Enrollment. So you have seen this slide before. We said two years ago after Harvey stated these goals that we would like to see the enrollment in ag and natural resource related majors on campus to be at 4,200 students by 2018. And you can see the percentage increase that that would reflect from 2011 in the slide and the base numbers we were starting from at that point in time. 
So those were the goals we articulated. There's some audacious, audacious one there. You may think the undergraduate one's the audacious one. The graduate one is the audacious one. That's a big increase in graduate students across the institute. Now this is hard to see, and I have to put about 15 disclaimers on this, or else I'm gonna get in real trouble across the street. Um, the real numbers come out next week. Barner Hall will put them out, and they will be the official university numbers. So our best estimates here, based on where we think we are, look like this. And what you'll see here is for the university as a whole at UNL, will be just under 24,500 total enrolled students. And in ag and natural resource related fields of study, there's some interesting things going on here. Our enrollment in undergraduates continues to go up in excess of 5%. That's with increasing size of classes and increasing graduation sizes of classes. We had our highest all-time enrollment two years ago. We broke it last year, we broke it again this fall. And we broke it with a huge freshman class. Uh, what, 17% Dean Waller, I think? First time freshman increase in our freshman class in Kasner this fall. So big numbers that are going up there. The real, real interesting one for me was this one. For the first time in a number of years, we have about a 7% increase, a little under 7% increase in graduate and professional students. I'm really glad to see that. Really glad to see that happening. And we'll come back and talk a little bit about that here in a few minutes. So when you put those in aggregate, at the university level, we obviously have a challenge, right? We still got 5,000 students to build at the university level to get to 30,000, 5,500 to be exact. And, but at INR, relative to where we said we wanted to contribute our goals, we're on track. And if we continue to clip the students at the rate we have the last two years, bringing those students to campus and servicing those students well with our programs, we'll meet that enrollment goal of 4,200. And I'm very pleased about that, very happy about that. And there's a lot of reasons for why that's happening. The current six-year graduation rate, which is another one of the goals, the six goals, is somewhere around 77%, maybe just a hair under that, Steve, I think. Um, for this past year for Kasner. So we already were above the average, but I would like to see that continue to improve as well. I'd like to see that at 85%. And we've said that as one of our goals uh, moving forward into the future. Now I wanna address a few pieces of this that I hear uh, routinely from our faculty. And they're real issues that I want us to think carefully about. Qual quality and quantity. You know, there's often a real, real uh, easy trap to fall into to build numbers, but decrease in quality. And I know all of us have thought about that. You know, do we continue to build the quality of our student population? Do we continue to build the quality of our graduates? Do we continue to serve the needs that those graduates will have? You know, there's a big, big clamor in higher ed right now about what we're doing for students in the workforce. You can't miss it in the press. We're in, a, we're in a good spot here because we're in a field where we're training people broadly across a lot of disciplines for areas that have need people. And there's demand, there's workforce demands there that are, that are causing, frankly, part of this enrollment. That's where part of the enrollment growth is coming from. So we're in a good position, but we can't let our guard down, is my point. So academic rigor is, of course, important, and we continue to look at our curriculum, curricula and what we need to do to make sure we have the academic rigor and the graduates prepared for the, the workforce they're going to go into. So we're not gonna let our guard down on that, number one. This is an article that was in the Omaha World Herald just a few days ago. I don't know where it came from, honestly. It showed up and I went hallelujah, praise God, you know. <laughs> but it talks about how our ambitions here academically are world class. You know, that's, that's what we're about is continuing to have world-class ambitions and world-class graduates from this institution. And we don't want to forget that in this building of students that we're under. Uh, services for these students. You can't have your head stuck in, a ground, in the ground and drive around city campus and look at all the bricks and mortar going up 
and the beautiful facilities. I tell my kids I don't understand why they need all that stuff, but they want that stuff. And you see these beautiful new dormitories and revamping of dormitories, great capacity that's been built downtown and continues to be built downtown. Another nice new dorm open this fall, another one next spring. But then you can't walk around with your head in the ground and walk past Burr and Fetty and wonder what's going on. I'm married to a Burr Hall graduate. I hear about Burr Hall a lot. And there were Fetty names and there were Burr names. And I, so I, I know the history that's there and the culture that's there. It's valuable to people. And we're in a situation currently where we've got to figure out what we're going to do about that. Because those halls are at the end of their useful life. And in order to rebuild those halls, they're hard to cash flow with the number of students that you would put into a, think, downtown style new housing. We know there's 500 students that are demanding space on East Campus. That comes out of a study that housing did this past year. And that's looking out into the future with enrollment growth and so forth. So now we're in, this, in the task where in the next two years, we have to figure out what to do about that because by 2017, we have to be out of those buildings for fire code purposes. So we've got a challenge ahead of us there. You're going to hear us begin talking a lot about that and how we're going to think about housing on East Campus, both undergraduate and graduate and professional students uh, as we move forward. So that's, that's something we have to pay attention to. Building a great new rec center out here without housing you know, I'll, I'll let your, your logic conclude that one. Okay. We also have to be very concerned about our faculty and staff resources if we're going to continue to serve our students and our constituents in the way that they deserve. So we're, we're serious about that and about how we equip our faculty, how we have adequate numbers of faculty. That's been a lot of our discussion these last uh, couple of years. And we have to not let our guard down on recruitment as well. And I want to do a little shout out here to a number of different groups. Departmentally, we've got some great things going on in recruiting across the institute. Admissions at UNL has stepped up their game. And they've stepped up their game with INR as well. And we're seeing the results of that. Amber Hunter and her group, uh, Amber's now married, I apologize Amber. I didn't call your married name. But it, you know, you know, they, they've stepped up their game, and uh, we are seeing the result of that. Extension has stepped up its game in the state. And I can't tell you how committed the industries are in the state to recruiting for us. That's part of the reason we've seen those numbers go up. And I hear it everywhere I go, you know, that people are out there recruiting for us. They want students here. They're trying to get students here for us, and we can't let our guard down there as well, is uh, the bottom line. Okay, let's talk about faculty growth and resources for faculty growth. So third goal, increase faculty resources. I think the number that Harvey threw out in 2011 was just under 170 new tenure-track faculty across the UNL campus over that six-year time horizon. We threw out the goal that we would like to have 50 plus new faculty in INR. Now keep in mind INR's budget is a little less than a third of the universities. So you can kind of calculate math that way if you're thinking uh, that way as we move forward. Across all three of our mission areas, balancing teaching, research, and extension across all three of our land grant mission areas. You are familiar with what we're doing currently that we announced uh, last fall that we were going to move into a hiring phase to increase our tenure track faculty ranks by roughly a little under 10% um, in number. And we announced the uh, formation of 36 new positions to do that. We have worked really, really hard. And I've got to congratulate the Institute broadly for this because there's been tremendous effort that has gone into this recruiting process since we started announcing positions January, February time frame of this calendar year, just a few months ago. I changed this slide a half hour before the meeting because we got our 18th offer letter signed this morning. We have three more offer letters out currently. That's the other three you see in the slide. Um, 
and we have, Ron will get me, I'll get this wrong, but there's four more, I think, that have finished interviews or are right at the cusp of finishing interviews. So we're going to be roughly two-thirds of these positions we should have filled at the beginning of the fall semester. That's phenomenal. And if you remember our discussion about this when we announced it last fall, one of the big concerns we had was how long will it take us to get this done? Can we possibly get this many positions hired? I will tell you what my counterpart, Ellen Weisinger, said to me when I was kind of telling her we were thinking about this and we were thinking about hiring this many at one time. She said to me, don't do it. Now, I know she didn't want us to do it because she wasn't doing it. Well, I didn't say that. But <laughs> Ellen, Ellen will take that well. But no, her point was that will be really hard to do. Hiring that many people across a number of departments and multiple departments is going to be really hard to manage. And so I have to give credit to the search committees, the departments, the administration and the units. Our dean's council has shepherded us very carefully with those clusters of hires. They've all worked very carefully with them. And the guy in the middle here has done yeoman's work. He's met every one of these candidates. He's interviewed every one of them. Um, he has shepherded it every day, at least twice a day when he sees me. It's, here's the latest update on where we are in this. You know, he's really shepherded it. So I'd like you to give Ron a, a round of applause. So there's a little bit of the flavor of the people that we're going to have joining us. And when you put that on top of the recent several years of young faculty, new faculty we brought to campus, we've got a really talented core of new people who are coming to join us. And that's just the first half. You with me? I also like the fact that that's got a lot of, you know, people from a lot of different backgrounds and from a lot of different places and a lot of diversity there that's going to be coming to our campus for our students. I'm excited about that, too. We also have a number of, of spousal hires that have occurred as a result of this. I think there's three, these positions plus a few others we already were recruiting, that we've had spousal hires coming to us as a result of the, the uh, 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 process as well. So we're excited about those folks. Uh, they'll start, some of them are starting to join us as we speak, and they'll trail in through the coming nine months onto our faculty um, over the next year. We have some other positions we've added as well. Water for Food, the Water for Food Institute has allowed us to hire five new faculty in INR into positions. A number of you have been part of this kind of long going process of the water cluster hires. You'll hear me talk a little bit about that later in the meeting. As well as bringing on board Roberto Linton. We've just hired Christopher Neal, who will be coming as the new research director starting October 1 from Utah State. And we're in the process of hiring a policy director. So when you accumulate those together, there's another nine positions there that we've added just in water around the water for food opportunity. I am expecting the same thing will be true of the Rural Futures Institute, that we'll have opportunity to bring clusters of new hires in around that as well. We've had a lot of questions about how we're doing this, where the funds are coming from. I went through at some length with you in the, the October meeting last fall. If you remember, I went through all these budget numbers and where the money comes from and how we're able to do it. This is how we're able to do it. We are determined to use every dollar we have as effectively as we can. And we have a lot of different sources of revenue. We have state appropriated dollars. We have federally appropriated dollars. We have revolving accounts and cash auxiliary accounts across a number of different units, both on campus and across the state. And we, we have worked hard to deploy those so every dollar is at work. That makes sense? So some of this new hiring is from new use of money and re rethinking the way we use those dollars. And with Jeff and his team and Alan before him, uh, we've been able to figure that out and figure out how to better use those dollars. I expect that to continue, that we'll continue to see some growth in those numbers and we'll be able to do it. We also know that there's a balancing process between where we are today, getting the last 18 of these 36 hired, 
and starting the next wave of new hires that I'll talk a little bit about here in a moment. And what happens when someone retires or what happens when a core need in a department comes open? So we've designed a process for how we're working with departments and the Dean's Council to make that work. So we don't lose capacity in an unexpected way that we don't refill. And then we're also looking hard at how we invest further in TA support. How can we provide more support to graduate students to help us also on the teaching side uh, from what we have traditionally had? Now, Ann and Josh, who are here from the foundation, always wait to see what new challenge I'm gonna give them in this presentation. They know about this one. But we also know that to grow our faculty and grow the international stature of our faculty, we need more endowed chairs here. And we've got a lot of great professorships, we've got a few endowed chairs, but we want to grow that number. So at the leadership retreat this summer with the unit heads and the directors of the centers and programs, we talked a lot about this. And we have a campaign we're calling 25 by 2025. I do like the number 25. <laughs> and the idea there is that we will have at least 25 new endowed chairs in INR, and by endowed, I mean at the presidential level, several million dollar endowments uh, that will generate extra support for the people holding those chairs and for their students. We just announced another one uh, earlier in the last couple of weeks uh, that Dr. George Graff will be holding as the soybean chair with Bayer Crop Science. Uh, we announced yesterday at the Nebraska Bankers Association meeting a uh, drive that was lead gift funded by one of the bank members of the Bankers Association, Bruning State Bank in Bruning, for the Ron Hansen Endowed Chair in Ag, ag Banking and Finance. So there, there we have a whole series of these that now are on the map, and I'll be talking to you about those as we bring them on board. TA support. We thought it was important to add some TA resources, particularly in areas of the institute where there might be deficiencies in supporting the, the teaching program. So this summer, we put out in a very fast track way to the departments, the opportunity to apply for and compete for some additional TA support from central funds. $250,000 we allocated uh, out to the departments that way to provide additional TA support uh, for the teaching program in those units. We also have used some central resources that we're applying to some specific areas relative to graduate teaching assistance or research assistance. Again, from the central level, this first one is a pilot project in biochemistry that Professor Simpson, Melanie Simpson, is running, where she thinks she'll have the opportunity to have a T32 project for training of graduate students from NIH, and we're funding that at a $250,000 level as a pilot this year uh, in a cross-disciplinary way in the life sciences. In the life sciences generally, we're putting $65,000 into TA support, to, primarily to support the Life 120 and 121 sequence that's new this fall, and we expect that we'll need to ramp that up further in the future. And then this last one is not implemented yet, but it's approved that the Institute will provide a quarter of a million dollars per year, and USDA will provide a quarter of a million dollars per year to fund graduate students to work jointly with the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center at Clay Center. So to programmatically support those areas as well. So uh, opportunity for us to grow graduate students. We also have started a new program that Dean Waller is managing in Kasner. I'm tempted to ask him to change it to RSVP, but it's you know, RVSP is hard to say. Um, this is a visiting scholars program that we're envisioning for each of the units to have the opportunity to bring a visiting scholar to campus for a short duration period, up to several weeks, to interface, work with, teach, and interface our students. And we're providing the support for that in the form of travel, support to get them here, and to house them while they're here. So we're excited about that opportunity, where each unit, including the district centers, will have the opportunity to do up to two of those per year to bring in visiting scholars across the institute for, I think, all the obvious reasons you might think. Now before I bring Susan up, I just want to speak a little bit to the next phase of hiring. You'll remember that we talked last October about these first 36 positions, and we went through this big process, institute-wide, 
to get to what those 36 positions were with all of the unit heads and district directors and departments involved in that discussion. And there were about 19, if I remember correctly, that made it through that process that were on the list that we sorted the 36 out of. So there were actually 54, right? So there were 19 additional positions that we kind of held back as, where do we go in the next phase as opportunities that are out there? We're still evaluating what those 19 might be and the next others that may come to be relevant in this short time period. But our hope is that when we're in FY15, that we'll be having that discussion about what those are to be able to start that phase two process to add to these first positions. So that's our plan. And we talked a lot about that at the leadership retreat as well. You also notice I added in the water for, water for food positions up there in phase one and then these three spousal hires and some additional people that we're gaining out of that process uh, as well. Susan, if you want to begin to make your way on up, I'll finish this section out while you're getting set up. We also have talked about how important it is for these new faculty as they come to campus to be supported. There's a tremendous number of people coming all at one time and a tremendous number of, of amount of talent that we're bringing to our campus all at one time. So the Dean's Council uh, has taken the lead role on this of thinking about what that mentoring framework and network will be for those new faculty and how we need to build that and support them both at a central level as well as down in their units, including having senior mentors to work with them, including having opportunities for them to develop as a cohort group and to learn from one another and to work across disciplines with one another in the way that we've talked about being important. So this new faculty success network, uh, Dean Waller and Dean Hibbert and Dean uh, Kostelnik um, and Dean Clutter are all working together on that to, to have a plan for as these new faculty arrive, to plug them directly into this new way of mentoring. And we thought it was important to go back a couple of years as well and grab the newest faculty we have on campus to really pull them into that frame as well. So you can all think of those folks in your, your programs and units who we think will benefit from that moving forward. Now I'm gonna take a break there and I'm gonna ask Susan, who I told you a little bit about before, to I've asked her to share one or two songs with you from this portfolio of music that she has developed. Uh, I only heard a couple of the songs she was thinking about when we were thinking about this last year, last summer, I guess it was, Susan, and talking with the, uh, the lead center. And one of the songs that she had done by that point in time, it couldn't have been more timely. Uh, she actually performed it for the, the uh, lunch we had the day the Secretaries of Ag were here last September. Uh, and we honored the four former Nebraskans who have been a Secretary of Agriculture uh, from Nebraska. And at that luncheon, she performed a couple of the songs, and one was about uh, waiting for the rain. And if you remember, last September, you couldn't have been better timed to be thinking about waiting for the rain. And that was one I suggested for today. And there's another one about a young person that she'll tell you about uh, when she does the song that inspired her to do it. So please welcome Susan Werner. <laughs> With your eyes to the west, you keep watching the sky While the leaves start to curl Cause the crops are so dry It's like everyone says It does no good to complain But it gives you something to do While you wait for the rain Take a walk through the fields The corn's about to set ears You start praying to God Though you haven't in years 
You hope the old man can hear Cause you're feeling some pain From the bills coming in While you wait for the rain And just off to the north See the clouds rolling by Hear the thunder And have you been especially selected for torture? Getting so late while the rest of the world just continues to spin. They got business to do, businesses you ain't in. Some place like Taiwan gets a damn hurricane while you spit in the dirt, while you wait for the It's getting late It's already too late Get nine-tenths of an inch Or get nothing at all By the end of July Well, the difference is small Hundred thousands of bucks Are going right down the drain Say goodbye to your year Finish off one more beer Finally let slip a tear While you wait for the rain Okay, thanks, So Susan will come back and do the other one at the end, okay? Um, so I think you can see why we were very compelled by her talent. So tonight at the Lead Center, it's a free concert in the main hall, main stage of the Lead. There are tickets on the back. It is ticketed, but it's free. So if you don't have a ticket and you'd like to go, please pick one up on the back table on your way out uh, and come see Susan tonight. She'll do two sets. I think the first set's all that music, the, the new album, and the second set is a greater uh, part of her portfolio from other songs she's done. So let's keep moving forward. I'm better than half done, all right? <laughs> Just to forewarn you. So we're making good progress. I also want to highlight, in terms of building people, this new program that the Business and Finance Group is rolling out currently. And this goes back to the 2025 recommendations. So go back now three years ago and think about all of the things we had in those 52 recommendations that the task forces brought forward for us 
A lot of this hiring and everything else we're doing came out of that. And there was a big piece of that about staff development and about how we could better develop and mentor our staff. And Alan Moeller and Jeff Basford and their teams went to work on this uh, over that period of time and they have a new program that they'll be rolling out beginning this fall called Inspire that is targeted around talent management for staff and mentoring and developing staff in a career pattern way across the pattern of their life. So finding the right talent in how we hire people, how we develop those people, and how we move them through their career to greater uh, things as they move forward. So Inspire's the name. There's a lot of aspects of this I don't have time to cover, but I want you to kind of get the idea of why it's important, why we think talent management is key and important for all of our employees and especially our staff and that they have opportunity to develop and you'll see some of those guidelines there. We want to increase our performance. We want people to be more satisfied in their work. We want them to be excited about why they're here. We want them to understand well what they do and why they do it and it all builds on developing that talent. So this system is designed to do that. We hope it will result in greater employee engagement. We hope it will result in better advancement of our staff and seeing opportunities to advance and move forward professionally in their careers as they develop. And we especially hope it will bring us the right talent when we start to hire new staff and we think about what those talents that we need are. Their rollout plan, as I said, begins for that this fall in November. It will be based around the Strengths Finders program, uh, aspects of Gallup, and out of their, their background and work. So it will be based in that, and there will be opportunity for current employees to begin engaging in that way in November. And then you'll see it moving through implementation in 2014 uh, as we roll it out uh, fully. So the team that's been working on that, I know Daisy Brayton's here and your team has worked hard on this and the website you see there um, that people can go to and learn more about it, inrhr.unl.edu, and we thank the, the team for doing that work and getting us started to help build further our staff. Research goal, so we're on goal four. Research goal, $300 million in research expenditures by 2017. Now, if you have been following the press, and those of us engaged daily in research certainly know the challenges on research funding, and we've already talked about that at the federal level, and we have begun to see the impact of that at the university, just like all universities have begun to see it from the sequestration impacts on new RFAs at the federal level across the major granting agencies. I have to tell you, these numbers surprised me when I got them from ARD. And what surprised me was that INR didn't go down. So if you look at the numbers between FY12 and FY13, so FY13 we just finished, June 30th, and you look at the all UNL numbers for sponsored research awards, so these are grants received during that FY year, fiscal year, uh, you'll see that we actually increased in INR by about seven to nine percent, depending upon which measure you're looking at. So that's a good, good thing. The university was not so fortunate. When you look at NIH dollars and DOE dollars in particular, um, and DOD dollars, uh, there was lost ground there, as you can see, at the university level as an aggregate that we're following and, and looking at closely. Research expenditures, we don't yet have for FY13, so I can't show them to you. I can only project what they might look like. These are FY11 and 12 numbers that you've seen before, and we had a huge jump last year in research expenditures within INR. It was a record year, actually, in increase of research expenditures for us historically. I expect our number, again, will go up this year just based on the grants and contracts number continuing to go up as well. But I'm, you know, whether it be 8% or 10%, I don't, I don't know. Our goal to meet the $300 million goal of the university is in 2018 to be at $160 million in total research expenditures, with about $55 million of that from federal to meet the federal hopes of our Office of Research and Economic Development. So we've got some ground to cover yet there, uh, and we certainly are watching the impact federal dollars will have 
on those numbers the next couple of years and are hoping for the best of success for our faculty. So that's the research side, national and international awards. I'm not going to read these to you. I could show you 15 pages of these. We asked the departments for these the last few days, and I literally got 15 pages of lists like this of prominent awards from our faculty and staff at the national and international level. The goal that, that uh, the chancellor articulated really was for the very prestigious national awards, National Academy, National Academy for the, National Academy for the Advancement, Association for the Advancement of Science, NAAAS, right? Those kinds of awards. And you see some of those on here, on this first slide. And we have awards across departments, we have awards across units and mission areas of the institute, and like I say, I could show you pages of these. And that's a testament to the quality of faculty that we have on this campus, and that we continue to see that happen. I can tell you that investments are being made, both centrally at the university and by us, in helping to ramp up our ability to apply for these awards. And I would encourage our faculty, I know they're a hassle, and I know that it's work to put together these, these dossiers for big awards. I would encourage you really to work with folks to do that if you're asked. Sometimes we don't always want to because it takes a lot of time. I would encourage you to do it, both for yourself, for your department, for the university as a whole, so we continue to have increases in those kinds of awards. Innovation Campus, Dan Duncan sitting here wondering what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> So you've, you've heard us talk about this. It's now moving fast. It's becoming real. And we're in the stages now of figuring out the what is going in Innovation Campus more than the buildings themselves. Up to now, we've been talking a lot about the buildings. Now we're in the process of actually filling the buildings and talking about what's going to be in them. You've seen this picture before of the first phase of development. These are the conceptual renderings of those four pieces of that. The uh, Innovation uh, Campus Companion Building here, the, the former 4-H FFA Arena here, the Life Sciences Collaboration Center here, the former Industrial Arts Building facility there. That is now underway, and I'll show you a constructed picture here in a moment of what it looks like today uh, from the construction that has occurred so far. Exciting opportunity for us. We've said it over and over again. The opportunity to bring public-private partnerships to our campus. The way to do that in a very flexible way across all kinds of relationships that we can see developing there. And we talk a lot about food, fuel, and water, but for a lot of areas of our campus uh, that are above and beyond food, fuel, and water, certainly that are of great interest to us, I and I and R. So the conceptual is turning to reality now. So this is the construction picture. There's a camera there, Michael, you know, around the clock. A uh, camera there, uh, watching the progress that occurs. I went down and tromped around illegally in there a few weeks ago <laughs> to see myself what was happening. And you can see here the companion building shell going up. The 4-H FFA arena uh, is being reconstructed now. The new roof is on it and it's being reconstructed inside now. You actually can see the ramps for the conference center going in on the, this end of that building. The footings are being laid for the Life Sciences Collaboration Center. These are the remaining walls that are being retained and the interior walls being built around what was formerly the Industrial Arts Building. So it's happening now. This 280,000 square feet of construction is underway. And we've been spending a tremendous amount of time, uh, especially some of you on our faculty, have been spending a tremendous amount of time over the summer talking with our first major partner in ConAgra Foods about the what inside that building. And these are pictures just from Wednesday of this week when we had 45 roughly of our faculty, uh, all of the Department of Food Science and Technology, and some faculty from other units on campus, and 25 of our closest friends from ConAgra in the room together talking about the vision for what the food science program and an innovation center around food science and health would look like at Innovation Campus and how we would see opportunity for that moving forward. That's a huge deal, not just for the food science and tech department, 
That's a huge deal for the university, for us to be able to do that with ConAgra and other partners we're building around that idea of that innovation space. So uh, it was a very productive discussion. I was very pleased with the way that turned out and, and kudos to the Food Science Department for taking the risk to be the pioneers here, to be the pioneers for developing this opportunity uh, on the campus as we move forward. The concept here is that we will move the Food Science Department uh, that will be announced Tuesday by the Chancellor in his State of the University address to this facility in late 2014, early 2015. That does a number of things for us, it does huge things for this food innovation area, for us to develop it fully to the vision of the program that they've had for a while. It does other things for us on campus because now we have more capacity on campus than we had before which has been a concern to us as well, where we're going to continue building this capacity for our faculty directly on the campus. You saw me talk about this last time, and I'm just underlining one thing in here. This is that PCAST report that I referred to as one of those discussions about reforming agricultural research and education at the federal level. And one of the things in that PCAST report said that there needed to be six innovation institutes developed around the U.S. in areas of importance for agriculture and food. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what we're thinking here. We're thinking we're going to be the Food Innovation Institute and that we want that to be in Nebraska and we want that to be on Innovation Campus. I know how big that sounds and how audacious that sounds, but that's what the way we're thinking. That's what we want to have the opportunity to develop here as we move forward. Those would be funded at $25 million a year from the federal government with federal funding flowing into them. So you can see how big and important that would be for the university and for Nebraska. Now I want to recognize in closing here this servant leader part of our discussion. So we've talked about the goals, kind of been through all of them now. You should see the, the synthesis of where we are in those goals. We've got a lot of great things happening. We've got a lot of people working very hard. I reiterate and come back and say we've got to focus now on making it happen and focus on the, you know, getting the noise out of the system for us. I remind myself of that every day when I come in. That I've got to think about what's important here and not let the noise get in my, in my way. And I hope you, you understand what I mean by that. Now I want to just thank a few people here up front before we give out a few actual physical awards. We've had some servant leaders who have transitioned for us in the last uh, six months since we were together. Uh, Alan Moeller, uh, the Assistant Vice Chancellor for 37 years at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, retired June 30th. And I saw Alan for the first time since he left the university yesterday because he got called back on deck to help us with the problem at Varner Hall and he was willing to come back and do that. It wasn't Varner Hall. It was, it was a problem we were dealing with, and we met in Varner Hall. Um, <laughs> um, Alan was a huge servant leader for this institution, and I think you all know that. We had a great celebration for him here in this room in June before he retired. It was a very touching day for him. Uh, I can tell you he looks very relaxed these days. <laughs> but a huge servant leader for us. And I can tell you, we miss him. You know, because you didn't realize how much he did until he was gone, and how much you automatically just knew Alan would know, so you didn't worry about. You know, so, uh, so anyway, I think you all know uh, what a great service he, he was to this institution and this state. Uh, Linda Beckner, who served as the director of the Panhandle Research and Extension Center in the Panhandle District, for UNL Extension and ARD, uh, has transitioned out of that role and is moving to Lincoln and will be part of the College of Education and Human Sciences in the nutrition area and she's launching off into a new part of her career, is very excited about it, we're very happy for Linda and she did yeoman service in her, her years at the Panhandle Research and Extension Center and is greatly appreciated for what she did uh, in that role. Steve Kochman, the forever interim chair. <laughs> Is that right, Kathy? 
of the forever interim chair of statistics. He was the forever chair, interim chair when I got here three years ago, so that puts it in context for you. He is very happy to see a new chair uh, here who's with us, and I'll introduce here in a few minutes, uh, that is assumed that role August 1st. So Steve's in the back. Thank you very much, Steve, for your service um, in that role. And now you can get back to bioinformatics, yes. Okay, and statistics that he's so good at. Tala Wada, Tala, is Tala in here? I didn't see her come in. Uh, Dr. Wada served as the director on an interim basis for a little over a year of the School of Natural Resources. She had served as the associate director under Don Wilhite uh, before he stepped back into the faculty last summer. And she did, again, a huge job of taking on one of our largest units in the institute and shepherding that through a transition to a new director uh, when John joined us just a few months ago. So Tala, uh, thank you very much for your service and your continued service to School of Natural Resources. So I would like, first of all, for you to give all three of them a big round of applause for their, for their service. A few new faces, Bert Clark, right over here, Bert, stand up. Uh, Bert is our new chair of the statistics department, joined us August 1st from the University of Miami. And is Jennifer here? May as well introduce her too. Jennifer Clark, his wife. Uh, we, we got a two in one that's like four. Um, and Jennifer is a new member of the Food Science and Technology faculty. Uh, also a statistician, works in computational biology from the University of Miami Medical School and she's leading our computational sciences initiative. So Bert, great to have you uh, in your role and Jennifer joining you as well. John Carroll. John is all the way back. John joined us as the new director of the School of Natural Resources, also August 1, uh, coming from the University of Georgia, where he'd been a longtime faculty member there uh, in the wildlife ecology area. So we're really excited to have John on board, and he's already um, figured out the path to my office. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> so, John, great to have you on board. We're looking forward to great things uh, in your service in SNR. Dr. Ron Rosati, Ron is here, I saw him come in earlier. Ron's also in the back. Uh, Dr. Rosati joined us July 1 as the new Dean of the Nebraska College of Technical Agriculture at Curtis, uh, was previously the Provost at Southeast Missouri State University in Southeastern Missouri. And so Ron, we're very, very pleased to have you on board and he's got lots of new capacity that he's gonna fill with students now at NCTA and we're very excited about having you join us as well. We talk a little bit about new places. I sent out an email here a few weeks ago, or I don't remember when it was, 10 days ago, with a big list of stuff that was happening. And I said, I thought it, this year was going to, I uh, predicted to be a landmark year in the history of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And I listed off a whole pile of stuff. And a lot of that pile of stuff was buildings. Remember? And I talked about all the new glitzy buildings downtown and all the, the develop, we've all been watching it happen. I mean, it's phenomenal when you look at what's happened in downtown Lincoln. And we're just beginning to understand that and understand what that's going to mean for the city. But there's a lot of things happening out here too. And sometimes I think we forget about that. We think that there isn't as much that's happening out on our little sleepy side of, of Lincoln. And there's a lot happening out here. And there's a number of new places the East Campus Rec Center, they finally cut the trees down the other day, I noticed. <laughs> Sad for the trees, but glad to see something happening on that project. There was an asbestos issue that held that back. Uh, so it's been later getting started than we anticipated. November is the start date now for the construction. And we'll have a new East Campus Rec as a result of that that was passed now a couple of years ago. Veterinary Diagnostic Center. We are very close to having all of the initial money raised for the start of that project. So we're now moving forward in the steps and the process to engage the architects and get that project moving forward. You'll hear me talk a little bit further about that here in a few minutes as well. Huge effort on the part of the foundation, huge effort on the part of the school, uh, the School of Vet Med and Biomedical Sciences of the Nebraska Veterinary Medical Association, the livestock industries in the state to be able to raise that money. That was not an easy thing, I will tell you when you start looking at trying to raise $4 million uh, for a project that's a laboratory to serve the needs of the state 
or diagnostics. So we're close and we're getting ready to start. Al Doster is clapping his hands in his head back there, all excited about the new opportunity for the new Vet Diagnostic Center. We just opened the new Life Sciences Annex. There was a $15 million project next door to our Vet Med building. You go over to the, vi to, uh, the Virology Center, the Morrison Life Sciences Research Center, also in that part of our campus, you'll see cranes in construction there for a new $8 million addition to the Morrison Center. So capacity around that area is, is wonderful. You've all seen this go up across the street just in the last few weeks. It kind of went from digging a hole to all of a sudden there's all this wood over there. And this is the first of those two that will be constructed. Uh, their plan is to be in it by the end of the calendar year. We have the second floor, entire second floor of this lease for the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources as suite accommodations, economy suites, studio suites for visitors to our campus. There are 13 of those units. So when you think visiting scholars, that might be a place we put visiting scholars or international visitors or recruitment for faculty or outstate faculty who are coming to campus for various reasons. So that will occupy that second floor and uh, the new building that will go up to the west of it will start as soon as Valentino's moves into the bottom of this one. And they'll go through demolition of the existing facilities. One of the things we're talking about in housing is with the developers who are building this relative to thinking about how housing might look in that area as well. You know, if you think about that area over to 33rd and back to Star Street, the university owns a number of those properties on Star Street those brick duplex properties. So we're beginning to think about, is that a place for a residential village for our campus? Is that a place for student housing? And thinking about that um, moving forward as well. This facility will be moved into by the students, I think next week, beginning this weekend and next week, uh, the new Alpha Gamma Row House, uh, just next door to the facility I just showed you. So you've seen that go up these last few months and you see them scurrying madly now to do the finishing work uh, to get those young men in that house. So very exciting. I have to tell you on a personal note, that's a wonderful thing. My father was the president of that house. My father-in-law was the president of that house as was my brother-in-law. So to see that happen is really cool personally for uh, our family. The C.Y. Thompson Library Project. It is now moving forward to conceptualization of the project. So the task force reported to us, including the libraries last uh, spring, and I envisioned this as a student success and learning center, similar to part of what's being done with Love Library downtown and parts of the, the Love facility. And we are intending to move forward with that. And now we're in the process of getting the cost estimate of what it will take. We have a very interested donor who wants to help us raise the money in honor of a graduate. Um, for that renovation to occur. So we'll see that moving forward, uh, we hope, in the coming year. This is, and I'll, I'll kind of close with this one before we make a few awards. If you look at this picture, it may be a little hard for you to see. That's the new building we were just talking about on South Holdridge. The mall is up here. So, you know, my office, is, the Ag Hall is right there. That space, I drove in the other day, and I'm driving in to come to the building, and I'm 15 minutes late, and Merge was saying, where are you? Um, and I pulled in, and I looked out there, and the landscaping people were cutting those three trees down. And I went, wow, I didn't know that was going to happen. And there were, there were good reasons they were doing that. It was tree health reasons they were doing it. But once that was done, there is one tree left over by Holdridge in that space. And we've been talking about how to get a visible entrance to East Campus for some time. So we are working with the landscape folks and the campus planning folks to design this as an entrance. Not at this point a vehicle entrance, but a physical pedestrian entrance to the campus that will, will say the University of Nebraska. Where you will know this is the University of Nebraska an important part of the University of Nebraska. And one of the things we had been struggling with was to know where we were going to put these gentlemen. <laughs> so we had these four statues that were commissioned last year as part of the 150th anniversary of the Morrill Act. 
These are the four Nebraskans who have served as U.S. Secretary of Agriculture. So we have these three bronzes of Mike Johans and Clifford Harden and Clayton Yider, and we have a big wood statue of Catawba wood of J. Sterling Morton. And we're also planning to do a bronze of that as well, or in the process of planning that. So all of a sudden, when I saw them cutting those trees down that day, I went, oh, gift from heaven. <laughs> Maybe that's the place where those will go. So we're, we're studying that. We're studying what that might look like. And if you can think back to South Holdridge here, looking into campus, you're looking into the mall, and into Vista is Chase Hall up on the end if you're looking from the outside looking in. So we think that creates some wonderful opportunity uh, for us as well. A little aesthetic thing there. And then lastly, Chuck Hibbert and his team, Kathleen Lodel, are leading an effort around a new facility at the Nebraska State Fair. This will be called the Nebraska Building. It's the last building under construction there on the grounds in Grand Island. The shell is basically up now, the steel work is up now. And it will open before the fall next, next uh, summer. And it, half of that building, 25,000 square feet, is reflected in what you see here, which will be a living museum interactive learning center about agriculture and food in Nebraska. And it'll be open year round for school children, for UNL Extension. UNL Extension will man it during the year, will be officed there, and it will be uh, all about the natural resource system and agriculture in the state. So we're thinking big here as a museum quality kind of facility funded outside of the university, funded by industry, funded by the people in the state uh, with UNL Extension being able to deliver on that science literacy around food and agriculture. On the opposite end of this building in an adjacent space of similar size will be the Game and Parks Commission, uh, the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission on natural resources and you know, the natural abundance of those in Nebraska. So it'd be a beautiful building, we're looking forward to that. Chuck's busy raising a couple million dollars uh, and is well on his way uh, to achieving that and making that happen. Now, in closing, I wanna present the next round of Servant Leader Awards through the Omtwite Innovation Program. You'll remember we revisited this last spring and we gave several of these awards out. Uh, we gave one to the Gut Function Initiative team. We gave one to the Nas uh, National Drought Mitigation Center for their work. We gave one to Bob Klein for never saying no to anything and being, being a huge servant to the university and the state for over 50 years, to Barry Shaw for facilities, to Jim Alfano for the building and implementation of the new microbiology major. Today, we'd like to give a few additional innovation awards. And the first one is to David Harden. And David's sitting over here with Laura. Uh, David, if you'll stand. We're just gonna have them stand and let me talk about them and we're, they'll get their money and their, their pretty stuff afterwards. David has been the person that's made the professional program in veterinary medicine happen. Going back to 06, 05 kind of time frame. And then on top of that has been the person along with his staff and with uh, Al pushing him in the back there on the veterinary diagnostic lab that we're now bringing to reality as part of that program. So in honor of that, David, and your service to the School of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences and building that program and now the veterinary diagnostic lab, we thank you for your service and your leadership. Uh, you see him pictured there with Alan Moeller. I chose that picture uh, for a reason. Uh, the school chose to honor Allen with its, I, I think you would call it the biggest honor you could present, um, with that bronze he's holding that is about being a veterinarian and about caring for animals. And Allen was a huge, huge part of that story. So David, you carry Allen with you, I know that. Um, so congratulations on, on uh, your service to the university. This next one's a group award, and it's not to a group who's part of an initiative or part of a center. There are a group of people who have really stepped up and made a difference in the launching of the Water for Food Institute. There's a, there's a little bit of hesitance to know exactly how you engage with a new institute like this, 
especially when we've been doing a lot of water stuff for a long time. But these folks did. They really decided to step up and make a difference. Each of them in their own way, not necessarily always as a group or as a team, but I wanted to honor the four of them together. Swat Ermock. Swat, where are you? I saw you sitting over here. Uh, Swat's the Everhard Professor, recently awarded that last fall in BSE. And I think you all know of his reputation and credibility internationally in irrigation and water resources management. Uh, he is often cited by USDA as one of the most impactful people funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture for the Ag Water Demonstration Network. SWAT stepped up in a variety of ways with Water for Food. He's been all over the world with that group. And he was the, the Interim Water Center Director for this last year before we brought on Dr. Chidura John Ray uh, just this summer as the new, first new Water Center Director we've had in some time on our campus. So SWAT, thank you for your contributions to the Dougherty Water for Food Institute. Dean Eisenhower. <laughs> Dean's up front here. Uh, Dean started his career at the South Central Ag Lab uh, near Clay Center and was one of the people that moved in to Lincoln when South Central was, was turned to a lab site a few years ago in budget cuts. Dean stepped up on the undergraduate and the graduate side. So he stepped up to work with the International uh, Water Education Center in Delft, the Netherlands. Uh, we were there together as part of a team uh, two years ago, Dean, probably, and has been, along with Ed Harvey, who just left the School of Natural Resources earlier this year, the guiding force behind the development of the joint master's program that we now have instituted between the Water for Food Institute and IHE, UNESCO IHE. So Dean, for that, and then secondly, he gets the Perseverance Award because he was the chair of the search committee for the water cluster hires. <laughs> and trust me, Linda Arnold says, nothing like this has ever happened again and never should again. <laughs> but, 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 but Dean, thank you very much for your contributions. <laughs> and then thirdly, uh, Daryl, we're our, Daryl's over on the side, Daryl Martin. Uh, I think all of you know Daryl, longtime faculty member in BSE, also in the water resources and irrigation area. Daryl's also traipsed all over the world with us. India, I remember a trip to India with Daryl a few years ago, uh, and, he, and he's been called on regularly and repeatedly by the Water for Food Institute to help us develop these relationships around the world. Daryl, thank you very much for your service. And then lastly, Ron Yoder. And he's already been talked about in, a, in his current job a little bit, but I can tell you that day to day, things would not be happening in the Water for Food Institute to get us to the level that we are, including getting people on board, including getting Chris Neal here as the new research director, if this guy wasn't recruiting him. So he's been active from day one. Don Wilhite, I think, was earlier your counterpart from SNR into thinking about the Water for Food Institute, but making it happen now and focus on making it happen is all uh, largely at the feet of Ron Yoder. So please thank Dr. Yoder. <laughs> and then the last one of these I wanna give is really an unusual one, because this guy is a three-year-in assistant professor at the University of Nebraska. And it's unusual for us to give awards like this that usually go to those of us with gray hair that have been around a while and been around maybe a few circus wheels, you know, that kind of thing. But this guy's pretty early in his career. But what he's done has been absolutely phenomenal at North Platte because he's developed a world-class research facility on use of you know, wind tunnels to study droplet uh, uh, you think of, of sprayer droplets and travel of those to where you might not want them to be. Uh, he's developed one of the two world-class facilities in the world in those three years in that area and has built a great team there, is doing great work. And Greg Kruger, you're in the back back here, and he even didn't wear his Ohio State scarlet today. <laughs> uh, but thanks, Greg, you're, all, you're doing a great job.
Couple things in closing. We haven't really publicized the Hearman lectures. You heard me talk a little bit about a couple of the upcoming ones later in the year, earlier in the talk. Um, this is going to be an interesting lecture on September the 30th. We've asked our very own Dr. Sally McKenzie to talk to us about GMOs and talk to us about all sides of GMOs and the science of GMOs. And if those of you that have heard Sally talk about that know she has a very strong, passionate uh, opinion and science-based opinion on GMOs. So Sally will be delivering the Hearman Lecture on September the 30th in Hardin Hall in the afternoon. So we hope that we will have a, a very good crowd there. We also are really working hard to get our students to these lectures. We want to get as many of our students there as we can, and especially for one like this. I would hope we would have a lot of our students there uh, to hear what Sally has to say. The Rural Futures Institute, their national, next national conference is November 3rd through the 5th here in Lincoln. They opened their registration earlier this week and they tell me that they're on faster pace than they were two years ago and are afraid they're going to sell it out very quickly. So um, uh, that conference coming up, you will have noticed we are now interviewing finalists for the founding executive director position of the Rural Futures Institute. The second finalist finished his interview here yesterday, uh, David Ivan from Michigan State, and Chuck Schroeder um, interviewed about three weeks ago or thereabouts. So we expect prior to this conference to have the founding director named for the Institute and they'll be with us for that conference and talking about the vision of moving it forward. Last thing, extension. Those of you that are part of UNL Extension, and there's a big group of you that are, this is the 100th anniversary year of the Smith-Lever Act from 1914, coming up in 2014, for the anniversary of that legislation that enabled federal extension and cooperative extension in the states to be funded with federal funds. And I know our extension team has been working around how to celebrate that year and think about 21st century extension moving forward, Dr. Hibbard, and we'll be doing that across the state. So you'll hear Dean Hibbard and his team talking about the, the centennial celebration of the Smith-Lever Act uh, coming up over the course of the next year. And then I wanna close with this slide. You know, it's, sometimes it's, um, you know, I talked about focus earlier Sometimes it's really easy to lose the focus of how much you have. You know what I mean by that? How fortunate we are, how blessed we are, how lucky we are. You know, I, I, I pinch myself a lot of days. I've got the best job I've ever had. I love what I do. Sometimes I wish I could be more in the classroom and I'm actually teaching a class this fall or working with Deepak who's teaching the class and I'm just showing up to <laughs> provide an opinion because I miss that. And we're, we're very fortunate for the people we have, the students we have, the faculty we have, uh, the resources we have. And sometimes we can lose sight of that pretty easily. You know, we can think that we sure would be nice to have more, or it sure would be nice to have, not worry about a reallocation of, well, I started talking about that and it went off a reallocation of dollars, but we are really, really fortunate. We're really fortunate to be where we are, when we are, at this point in time in the history of this institution. I'm serious about that. I don't hear that from other people around the country. We're lucky. We're fortunate to be where we are, and we can make a huge difference every day with what we do. I, I see it every day. I see it in our, our all aspects. These are students. These is, this is a graduating class from last um, May from Kasner. And you, you think about the impact those young people are going to have, and you think about the impact the PhDs and master's degrees that we grant at this institution, and you think about the impact of the degrees the students at NCTA graduating with degrees are going to have. They're going to lead the world in many, many respects. And they're going to change the world that we live in. So don't forget how lucky we are. And let's just focus. Thank you very much.